My oh my, do I have a treat for you today. We are going to podcast Richard Gray Stevenson III, DDS. He has his bachelor's degree in chemistry from UCLA in 1982 and his doctor of dental surgery from UCLA in 86. After practicing general dentistry for seven years in Laguna, Niguel, California, he accepted a full-time teaching position at the UCLA School of Dentistry as an assistant professor in the section of operative dentistry. For four years, he served as the chair of the preclinical operative dentistry course, where he authored a comprehensive illustrated syllabus of operative dentistry. Dr. Stevenson has been recognized by his students on five occasions as the teacher of the year and has received numerous additional teaching awards from 20 different classes of students. He also received the UCLA Academic Senate Distinguished Lecture Award for non-Senate faculty in 2003. In 2009, he received the ADA Distinguished Golden Apple Teaching Award in both the pre-doctoral and post-doctoral categories. In 2005, he received a fellowship in medical education from UCLA School of Medicine. He has over he has published over 30 articles on dental materials uh, in the principles of evidence-based dentistry and restorative techniques in peer-reviewed journals, including Operative Dentistry, Evidence-Based Dentistry, the Journal of Aesthetics and Restorative Dentistry. He is the co-author of a book chapter on cast gold restorations in Summit's fourth edition of Fundamentals of Operative Dentistry. The chapter on implant occlusion in the new book, Implants in the Aesthetic Zone, and the chapter on Complications in Restorative Dentistry, Best Practices. He has authored numerous syllable guide, instructional guides, and in all aspects of restorative dentistry for UCLA and other schools. He is the inventor of the RGS Instruments, a series of four calibration adjuncts to assist students and dentists with evaluating preparation parameters. He is a reviewer for the Journal of Operative Dentistry and the ADA Professional Product Review. He's a member of numerous dental organizations. Since 2008, he has been the secretary of the Academy of Operative Dentistry, where he previously won an executive counselor, then president and a sector assistant secretary. He is a fellow of the Academy of General Dentistry and the American College of Dentists. He has been a charter member and past president of the Orange County RV Tucker Cast Gold Study Club since 92 and has demonstrated cast and direct gold techniques internationally at both the Academy of RV Tucker Study Clubs and the American Academy of Gold Foil Operators. In 2003, he was appointed uh, as a mentor of the Los Angeles Cast Study Club. Additionally, Dr. Stevenson has been mentoring four other cast gold study clubs, two in Peru, one to the pre-doctoral UCLA students, and one in Tokyo, Japan. Dr. Stevenson was the secretary of the Academy of RV Tucker Cast Gold Study Club for six years until 2011. He is both a lecturer and instructor in the UCLA Aesthetic Continuum, the Surgical and Restorative Implant Continuum, and has led numerous hands-on aesthetic sessions for visiting academics and study clubs at UCLA and abroad. Dr. Stevenson has given over 500 continuing education presentations and table clinics in restorative dentistry internationally, including the Philippines, Peru, Japan, China, Korea, Canada. In 2007, he became the 58th board certified operative dentist of the American Board of Operative Dentistry. In 2006, he was inducted as a member in the American Academy of Restorative Dentistry. The only other UCLA faculty to achieve this honor was the late professor Robert Wolcott, in 2011, he was named the UCLA School of Dentistry Alumnus of the Year in recognition of his outstanding contributions to organized dentistry, the school, the community, and the UCLA Dental Alumni Association. He is currently Professor Emeritus of Clinical Dentistry and served as Chair of the Re Section of Restorative Dentistry with over 100 faculty members for 17 years. He has made numerous instructional videos in restorative dentistry techniques, including ceramic inlays and onlays, dental materials, impressions, and dental photography. Uh, these videos have been viewed by thousands of dentists internationally. In 2009, he created the two-year postdoctoral advanced restorative clinical training program. He practices dentistry in West Los Angeles with a focus on microscope dentistry, implant restoration and aesthetics. He started a YouTube channel, which I love, in June of 2018, and in six months has over 7,000 subscribers. In 2015, he started Stevenson Dental Solutions, a teaching institute, and Master Milling Center, a dental laboratory, in 2014. He lives in Los Angeles with his wife, Savvy. Did I pronounce that right, Savvy? Perfect. My gosh, seriously, I am so honored. When you emailed me back and said you come on the show, I literally yelled yay. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's a pleasure, Howard.
So restorative dentistry, uh, gosh darn, I graduated in 87 and the hot new thing was the PFM. And we did mostly amalgams and composites. And I, I, I'm, when I tell you this, I don't know if you're old enough to believe this or not, but our operative dentistry instructor made us sign an ethical pledge that amalgams and gold were superior and these newfangled composites uh, were unproven garbage. And he told us when we left, if you are an ethical dentist, you'll stay away from these new composite plastic things and stick with the gold. And in my, all seven of my restorations are gold inlays and onlays. I don't have a composite. <laughs> so man, things have changed in our careers, haven't they? They sure have. And uh, for the better, I think. For the better, I think. So is gold, now you're out there in uh, in Los Angeles and Hollywoodville. I've always wondered, is gold, um, does anybody like gold restorations or is that just it, you uh, know, a dying always, art? I think it's both because there, there's a group of people out there that are seeking longest lasting restorations and they, they find people like me that can do gold restorations. Uh, in Los Angeles, where you would think that everything is focused on the aesthetics and those uh, maxillary anterior teeth looking absolutely beautiful in that B1 shade, you'd be surprised how many of those very same uh, patients will say okay to a gold onlay on, on a second molar or an inlay on a first molar. So I think it has its place in dentistry, and uh, unfortunately, it's pretty much lost its traction in dental schools at this time. Very, very few schools are teaching the kind of gold work that you and I did routinely when we were in dental school. Well, um, one of the things I've noticed on Dental Town is that when anybody publishes a uh, study that says posterior composites last six or seven years and amalgams last 30 or 38 years, every single dentist on earth says, well, not my composites. <laughs> maybe maybe everyone else's composites last six or seven years, but mine lasts as long as amalgams are gold. Do you think the, the average MOD composite is lasting as long as the average MOD amalgam or MOD gold inlay or onlay? Well, it's not what I think. It's what the what the literature shows us, and that's simply not the case. The amalgams do outlast the, the, those routine average uh, restorations. But I think the point of your, uh, your members and it is well taken that if they're done exquisitely well, I think composite restorations have a very long durability and very long lifetime. But doing really well means doing things like placing rubber dam, means uh, using high magnification, it means making sure that your curing lights are calibrated and, and properly curing the composite, it means layering techniques, it means understanding the occlusion and polishing the occlusal surface really well. I mean, a lot of things. And I think that uh, that may not be the case in uh, the average composite. I think that the average amalgam, on the other hand, uh, boy, it's a, it's a very user-friendly material. You know, it, you can place it underwater even, and it still works. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. I, uh, I have seen very average operators place amalgams that last many, many, many years, but have a lot of trouble with composites. But after they get some education in composites, they can usually place them quite well. But I think the proviso is, and all the manufacturers say this, and all the studies that look at composite longevity are looking uh, that that last as long as amalgams, for example, are looking at the ideal placement of these restorations. So I, I think that's uh, important for for people to realize. So um, podcasters tend to be young. About a quarter of our audience is still in dental school. Um, it seems like almost all the rest of them are uh, under thirty. In fact, please leave comment. And, and if you're watching this on YouTube, leave a comment. Tell me. Uh, how old you are, what country you live in, or email me howard at dentaltown.com. But what advice would you give to a young student? Um, there's a big threat on Dentaltown this weekend. And this uh, dentist said he's he just graduated. He's afraid to get a job as an associate at any of these um, big national chains because it just takes them so long to do um, uh, an MOD composite. So, right. so I, so I know what he's thinking, listening to you right now, he's thinking, will you, will you walk me through an MOD composite? And the reason, and the way I'm asked this question is 
when I look at insurance claims filed of the 32 teeth, there's just these four big spikes on the first molars. I mean, what's the tooth most likely to be root canal, crowned, extracted, replaced? So will you just um, walk through an MOD composite on a first year molar? Uh, so, so you're asking me to walk through the process of how you'd actually technically do that? Yeah, yeah, because they want to know like name brands. They want to know now. You got a lot of YouTube videos. How many? How many YouTube videos do you have on your channel? Uh, I think I have about forty-five right now. And and how do they? And what's the name of your YouTube channel? www.youtube. Uh, uh, it's Stevenson slash. Dental Solutions. YouTube. Oh, so it's youtube.com forward slash Stevenson Dental Solutions. So that's the same as your website, Stevenson. Yep. I, by the way, um, that's why I called you to be on the show. I am so impressed by your YouTube channel. I mean, you just, you can tell you really, really put a lot of time and effort and work on those. That's uh, amazing. Um, so, um, so is there a particular video in, in um, but you, you got a lot of videos um, on the, the YouTube channel, but, but, right. but go, going through the deal, like, um, is there, yeah, just go through your technique in general. Sure. Okay, so I, you know, first of all, I, I can totally relate to this student that is concerned about working in a major chain like this because there, he's going to be pushed beyond his capabilities uh, by, by the system that exists in, in, in those types of practices. And I share his concern. I actually started out in dentistry the same way. I graduated in 1986. I couldn't get a good associate job. Uh, the only place that was hiring was more of these uh, corporate large dental practices. They've been around a long time. And uh, while I was building my private practice, I had to work to pay the bills. So uh, it was, I, I almost got sick to my stomach walking into these places and, and seeing that I had three or four operatories with patients all in them already. And they're saying, okay, get them done. And then as soon as I'd finish a patient in a room, another patient would be plopped in the chair. And it, it, was, it was hard to do. I mean, you're used to doing a, a restoration in three hours, and now you have to get it done in, in I don't know how short of a time. It just, you could never be fast enough. You were always being pushed. And uh, I had a hard time with that. Uh, I really did. I always thought to myself, I'm not going to be the fastest person in this clinic, but I'm going to be the best. So at least I had that. And that was my approach for those first few years when I was doing that. And I, I advised my students the same thing. I mean, the reality is you graduate from dental school today, many of them have $500,000 in debt. I mean, that's that's a mortgage payment. I mean, back when we were in school, we'd, we'd graduate with maybe 30 or 40,000 in debt and we paid it off in five years. Now they're paying off these loans in 30 years. And that, that's some, that's it's a huge, huge burden for them. So. I think that the reality is they're going to have to find jobs wherever they can. Uh, and my, my recommendation has always been this, be the best, don't be the fastest. Be on the verge of being fired at all times, and then you're probably doing the job right <laughs> because you're just a little too slow. Uh, and I think that that's probably uh, what we should be doing. Don't get pushed beyond your abilities. Now, for the MOD composite, the procedure doesn't have to take an hour. You can do this procedure quicker. You can isolate fewer teeth with the rubber dam, and I think it actually will save you time once the rubber dam's in place. And then once you've, you've done that, you just need to follow a systematic approach. So we start with our burrs, we remove the old restoration, or we start the procedure, and then we obtain the extensions as we would in, in all of our board exams, stuff we know how to do quite well. But once that's all been established, I think that we have to use uh, the manufacturer's uh, bonding agents exactly as they're intended. So whether you're using a fourth generation, fifth generation, sixth generation, seventh generation, a universal, I think that what's really important is that you use it properly. I personally prefer using total etch or self etch system with multiple bottles. I like that. I was raised on that. I think that that's probably the the king of the bonding agents. But uh, whatever system uh, that, that you're provided at one of these clinics or that you choose to uh, to go for, uh, would can be used quite well if you follow the manufacturer's recommendations. Okay, so the tooth is isolated, the caries have been removed, you got your prep done, you're feeling pretty good about it, and that shouldn't take you more than about five or ten minutes. Even for a dental student, if you're really pushed uh, without anyone having to check every little step you do, you can get it done pretty quick. Uh, we've done this experiment at UCLA years ago. We gave students, uh, we said, you have five minutes to do a class two. 
And the entire class, after five minutes, had to get up and leave the room. And we saw some amazing preparations. It's almost uh, no dinking. You just got to get right down to business. In any event, uh, what I like to use are one of the sectional matrix systems. And there are many out there. I think that uh, they all have different nuances. Uh, they're very expensive. So I recommend that you probably just invest in a couple of them, uh, ones that you like. I, I like garrison's product the the fusion system is amazing but it's quite expensive uh the system by ultradent uh, called the v-ring system is very very good also quite expensive there are others that you can shop around for that are significantly cheaper that i think are are quite good so once this matrix section section matrix is placed i would recommend utilizing a centripetal wall technique so the composite could be placed in the box and then pushed over towards the band, like cured, and then that band and matrix assembly can be removed. And then you have the opportunity to do the same thing on the distal side, and then you've turned your class two into a class one. And I have at least two or three videos showing this particular technique on my YouTube channel, and I go through each and every step. Uh, this uh, relieves you of the need to use uh, a bulk fill product or a Toffelmeyer system. Uh, you don't need to use a flowable composite for this particular technique. You can use good microhybrids, nanohybrids, or hybrid resins. And I, this this uh, is so predictable. Now you've turned this class two into class one. And at this point, you build up the lobes. Rather than thinking about pushing it in like you would a, an amalgam, think about building the morphology of the tooth back incrementally. And usually you can accomplish this in about four steps, and then you've got your beautiful anatomy completed. If you follow this, you can save a lot of time in the occlusal adjustment aspects of things. So uh, people say, well, why? That's just so tedious. You have all these little steps. But I'm thinking, no, it's, it's not tedious ultimately because your occlusion is going to be closer to ideal. You're not going to have flash to clean up. You're not going to have blood in the way because of the rubber dam protecting you. So uh, I think that that uh, th this can work really, really quite well. It's a system. And the key is don't shortcut the system. Think about the system as being a step one through 10. And we can't just do from one to four to nine to 10. It's not going to work consistently for you. You're going to have problems like post-op sensitivity issues. You're going to have other dentists in your same group having to replace your dentistry. You're going to get uh, the stink eye of the office managers for problems like this. So I think that it's really critical that you follow a system. And the thing that's amazing is that the system gets shorter and shorter and shorter, but you don't skip steps. And that's the thing that, that happens with continued competency and with this, this quest towards mastery. It's not that you're shortcutting those steps. It's that you're able to do those steps more seamlessly in a shorter period of time and have the same quality output. Does the, um, what brand of composite are they all, which one, what bonding agent and composite do you recommend? I am a big fan of Kerr's uh, product called Optibon FL. It is a fourth generation total etch system, and uh, I've been using that for many, many years. And I was, uh, we researched all the products that we could use at UCLA, and this is the product that we chose for our own students to learn with. And uh, so, if problems were occurring based on, you know, this product not being user friendly or issues with the students, we'd hear about it really quickly. So, you know, we have 100 students operating in the clinic, and in any given day, and we would see that there would be issues. So uh, the dental school environment was a great place for this to, to I mean, it's proof of concept. And I have, happen to find this to be an amazing product. It's just one extra step uh, in the uh, bonding procedure compared to a single step procedure, and it doesn't take a lot of time, and post-op sensitivity is, is quite minimal. Uh, the composites that I use are, are various, and uh, I, I do like 3M's products. I like the Filtex Supremes. I think that they tend to be a little bit translucent for anterior work, and they're a little fussy in that respect. So sometimes uh, I fall back on tried and true products like Herculite XRV, uh, one of the older hybrid composites. Uh, very versatile product. It doesn't polish as well in the anterior, but it does provide us with uh, the opacity we need for maybe a class four restoration. 
Well, sometimes it's even good to have a couple different types of composites. So have a nice hybrid composite for building that class four restoration on the lingual and then adding a micro nanofill for the facial aspect of it for the surface so that we can have a nicer finish and uh, a better looking restoration down the road. Because it's, it's true that the microfills and nanofills hold a better polish than the old hybrid composite materials. Well, if I ask Dennis, what, what is the biggest stress about an MOD posterior composite? They always say contacts or sensitivity. Yeah. So you talked at the beginning about how you like the Garrison fusion system and the V-ring. Um, so again, will you just go back over contacts and sensitivity since those are the two biggest complaints? Right. Uh, well, well, prop- first, first of all, yeah. do you agree that's the two biggest complaints? I do. I think it's exactly what's happening. And there's about 10 reasons for sensitivity to occur. And sometimes we focus on, well, maybe it's just the bonding material, or I didn't get a good seal. But there are many other reasons. For example, you could be etching the adjacent tooth inadvertently, uh, which could cause sensitivity. You can uh, leave the occlusion slightly high. You can have gaps. You can have a light cure uh, system that's not uh, curing the composite adequately, which leads to all kinds of sensitivity. Uh, Perhaps you're not incrementally building up the composite, so you're putting stresses on the composite. You're not considering the C factor, the configuration factor. So all of these things can contribute to, to sensitivity, and I just think it's just... Follow this. Follow the steps. You know, one through whatever step you're doing, and do it the same way every time. And I think that if you follow the manufacturer's recommendations, and uh, like I said on my videos, I've got the techniques very well explained. I think that you're going to avoid sensitivity. When it comes to contacts, I think that we've pretty much solved that problem with the sectional matrices. And uh, as long as you are using a good spring on these sectional matrices, not a used one that's uh, old and not doesn't have a capable of uh, providing adequate tension. I believe that these are, are, are very predictable ways of ensuring proper context. It's, what's really key here is you cannot rely on a traditional Toffelmeyer matrix system. It's not going to provide you consistent contacts that we were able to achieve, for example, with our amalgam restorations. Well, that was easy because you're able to compact the amalgam against the band. You're able to burnish the band. It works very differently. Composite, as much as we think it's packable, is a very passive material. It goes where the walls tell it to go. You can't have composite push the band into position. The band is going to push the composite. So whatever you set up before you start restoring has got to be... uh, forming a a potential tight contact before you even place the composite. And I think that those are just, you know, little tips to help us with those two issues. And I I completely agree. Those are killers. And if we finish a composite and we have an open contact, game over. That's a failing restoration from day one. Patient's going to complain. They're going to get food packed in there. And then it's embarrassing for us. We have to do another restoration. We have to do it for free. And the patient's losing confidence in us. And what's to ensure that we're going to get it right the second time, right? I mean, so this is this is a big issue. And I think it just takes a little bit of time to make sure we manage the sectional matrices and the G-rings or V-rings properly, and we can uh, accomplish predictable interproximal contacts. You know, there seems to be two strategies in dentistry. Either they're low-cost, high-volume dentists, are there high cost, low volume? And man, I just don't think dental surgery and operatory is a game of volume. And when I when I start hearing dentists talking about, well, I don't want to use this bonding agent because it's two step. I want to use only a one step. It's like, could you imagine me being a 56 year old grandpa going in for prostate surgery or a bypass and the guy saying, well, I don't want to do this better prostate surgery. I want to I want to use this one because it's one step slower. And and so that's my trend. That's that's my I want to go find a guy like you who's got a microscope. Um, but, and so which leads me into my question about bulk fill. These guys say, well, I don't want to I don't want to use a two step bonding agent. I can use a one step. And why would I want to put an increment if I can just fill it up with bulk fill? So what is, what is your words of wisdom? to somebody using a one step bonding agent want to do bulk fill? Is, is it is that? good enough for 
your children and grandchildren or no i it howard it isn't and i i i i always i laugh because uh the amount of time you're saving in the operatory, I don't think any study has shown that that has uh, provided the patient with a better service or even an equal service. It hasn't uh, allowed you to make a better income. I don't think it allows you to sleep better at night either. I think that the joy of dentistry is in our quest for mastery and our quest for excellence. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about our profession is we're like that. We want to be that way. We were like that way in school. We were hungry. We wanted to learn. I think that students today are very, very potentially amazing uh, dentists. I think that, that we're putting out the best potential masters right now in dental schools. The educational system is incredibly good at doing what they do. The problem is once they get out of school, the pressures are on, and it's very difficult to create this consistency that I think you and I experienced. When I had, got out of dental school in 1986, uh, about the same time you did, uh, if I spent an hour on amalgam, that was the way it was. That was fine. Uh, I made a living. I made a good living. And things were working uh, quite well in that particular practice uh, model. Uh, today, uh, am I slow? Uh, maybe a little bit slow compared to some of the fastest operators in those clinics, but I don't think that the speed Hi is. I'm Dr. Richard Stevenson. Go ahead. Sorry. I'm playing oh, okay. One of your Sorry. Videos. I'm playing <laughs> one of your videos. I'm playing one of your YouTube channel videos. All uh, right. Yes. Uh, but I, I, I agree with you. I think that if uh, you treat every patient as though they were your spouse, uh, mother, father, or kid, I think that you're going to perform the best possible dentistry. And you're going to see time as being uh, uh, irrelevant because we have to provide quality dental care for our patients. So we just, we, we're, we're bound by that. that. That's an oath we've basically taken. But by the way, um, not not that you don't need any marketing at all. I mean, you got seven, <laughs> you have over seven thousand subscribers on your YouTube channel. But on Dental Town, um, when you make a post, you know, you know, on the YouTube channel, how you share and first it shows you a link, and right. the next button over is embed, and that's your code. On Dental Town, you can um, you can click that embed and drop that embed video in a post, so your YouTube channel is in the post, and every dentist. Oh, cool. Who starts uh, posting their YouTube channels on uh, YouTube? I mean, on Dental Town, their YouTube channel will double because there's a quarter million dentists on Dental Town, and my job is to point them in the direction of great content. And I think your videos are just amazing. And um, I think I think you should. And if you're shy, um, just say Howard told me to do this. I'm not self promoting. <laughs> Uh, say so this dentist guy told me to do this, but I, I, I wish people would look at your uh, your YouTube channel videos because the the attention to detail uh, is amazing. I want I want to switch gears completely. Sure. T t talk about your journey to start um, your Stevenson Dental Solutions uh, Continue Education Center. T tell us about your journey. By the way, on Instagram, he's um, Stevenson Dental Solutions. And thank you so much to the 25,000 dentists who follow me on Twitter, um, at Howard Ferran. I just retweeted, um, he's at Dr. Underscore RGS III. So that's, um, that's his name, um, Richard Gray Stevenson III. And I just retweeted that. He just said, I added a YouTube video. And by the way, it's a class two amalgam preparation. So I, so is amalgam, I mean, you just did a video on amalgam preparation. You're out there in LA. Is amalgam still alive? Is it still a restoration out there in LA? Barely. <laughs> Barely, Barely alive. Barely alive. But you know, one of the things about amalgams is it teaches us how to use our instruments and our hands really well. It's a great skills uh, training exercise. So dental schools that aren't even teaching amalgams formally in the in the clinic are still holding their students to this to the standards of trying to achieve that ideal amalgam preparation. I just, I just have one th one thing I want to remind um, people when it comes to amalgam is uh, um, I've had the honor to lecture in 50 countries and I'll never forget being in some um, developing nations. One one time it was in Tanzania and this dentist wanted to show me uh, his office and the, he wanted to do, he wanted to be a cosmetic dentist. And he did the preparation and the patient would sit up 
uh, rinse and spit in a pickle bucket. <laughs> and then he would put on the acid etch. And during every step, this, this little girl kept leaning forward and swishing and spitting. No rubber dam, no assistant, no high-speed suction. And I was looking at this, and, I mean, it was an amalgam on this poor little girl. Probably would have lasted 30, 40 years. He had exactly. no suction, no rubber dam. And I watched the whole procedure. It, it just couldn't have been anything but junk. And this poor little girl paid all this money. But what's this guy doing? He's on the internet. He's on YouTube. He's hearing people in rich countries like United States and Canada and Australia and New Zealand trash talk amalgam. And it's like, dude, there's, all, there's seven and a half billion people on earth. There's two million dentists. And over 1 million of them practice without high-speed suction, a dental assistant. And so, you know, um, I just, I really, it makes me cringe when uh, people trash talk amalgam when, and then when countries say that they should ban amalgam, it's like, well, if you, if you forced a hundred poor developing countries and got rid of their amalgam, and, and then those dentists are doing direct composites without high-speed suction and dental chairs and rubber dams. What do you think would happen to the quality of that country's dentistry? So, so but anyway, so why, what possessed you um, to make the um, um, the amalgam preparation? Just for, just good skills to know? Good skills to know. I think it is a, a viable uh, restorative technique that should stay alive in some way. Uh, you know, the pressures politically here in Los Angeles are extreme not to do amalgams. We we have waterline uh, management. Uh, we have uh, disposal management. It is so tricky nowadays. Uh, I don't I don't know, Howard. I think that that uh, your feelings and my feelings are very similar about this. But uh, what's going to change? I mean, how is it going to change? Uh, you know, you mentioned developing countries not having the adequate technology to perform composites properly. I, I totally agree with that. I think that an amalgam in, in those particular situations is the best procedure possible for that, that little girl. Um, it's, it's sad to see this happen. Uh, I, I, I won't say that I've completely given up. Uh, you can see that in my own subtle little way, I'm putting out videos on amalgams and amalgam finishing and polishing. I have a three part series on, the large amalgam, including how to finish and polish it. And that has been an extremely popular video. So I think that there's perhaps some hope that it's going to stay around. Uh, but the the political culture environment is so, so very strong. And social media has, has really uh, helped to uh, basically put the amalgam as uh, the least uh, likely procedure to be done by pa that patients are going to ask for. Um, so I, I don't know what the answer is. Uh, I think that having the amalgam out there and just saying, Hey, look, this is a possible procedure for you. This is how they look when they're done properly and they can last that patient, uh, many, many years, you know, on the cover of the ADA journal, I think it was probably about 15 years ago. There is a picture of a premolar with a class two amalgam in it. And it was a close-up. And it, the, the amalgam was done by Dr. Miles Markley. And Dr. Miles Markley was a master clinician. He used to teach at University of Colorado. And he was a big fan of amalgam. And uh, you looked at the amalgam you said, yeah, that's an old amalgam. But gosh, it's pretty good, man. It has a nice contact. Uh, the margins are sealed. It has really nice anatomy. And you can tell that it, it, it had been polished at one point. Now it's a little bit worse for the wear, but there's no need to replace it. And the caption at the bottom of the page said, this, is a, this amalgam is 58 years old. And I don't mm -hmm. believe that we're going to. And I think that uh, it's sad that that's happened. Um, but what can we do other than try to get people to do composites better and uh, maybe consider amalgams in patients that are looking for some kind of uh, different solution? Well, talk about your journey that led to the Stevenson Dental Solutions on Continue Education Center in West well, LA. I got to tell you, I love teaching at UCLA. UCLA was very good, good uh, for me and good to me, and I love the students. Um, I uh, in, in all dental education environments, uh, there's a changing political regime. There's an administrative branch that, uh, you know, the the. the it, one year it's uh, very conservative, one year it's uh, very liberal, 
And you just have to sort of navigate through that process. And I think after doing that for 26 years, I was I was pretty much ready to branch out on my own because I felt like in the academic world, you're a little bit uh, held back from really doing the teaching and uh, creating new things the way you really want to because of the realities of the dental school environment. I mean, you have to teach, you have courses, you have faculty, you have a lot of administrative responsibilities. So uh, I just have to ask myself, what do I love doing the most? Well, I love dentistry and I love teaching. And uh, when I looked at my job walking in every day as chairman of restorative dentistry, I said, wow, I'm not able to teach very much. And I'm not able to do that much dentistry. I'm only seeing patients a day a week. I'm only able to teach maybe a day a week in the clinic. The rest of the time I'm doing administrative work. So I said, what can I do to change this? And the only solution I could come up with is I just had to retire. So I actually retired early uh, after 26 years, but actually in the academic world, that's still kind of early. Um, but I, um, I found the solution in teaching outside the school, uh, teaching the way I want to teach, teaching in a, uh, I think in a way that probably uh, challenges students more, uh, provides students with more of a gut check when things aren't going well. Uh, in other words, photographing their work midway through a project and then showing that work on the screen for all the other students to see and critiquing what's right and what's wrong about the procedure and giving helpful hints. Do you think you can do that in dental school? No way. That never can happen. But in my center, I can do that. I can show them live demonstrations. I've got multiple video cameras. Uh, I have different types of magnification systems. I've got, you know, HD TVs. So we're showing the procedures live. I'm doing them. The students are watching me make mistakes. They're watching me struggle through certain aspects. They're seeing that I have to change strategies. They're seeing an honest approach to the fact that dentistry is not easy. And they love it. They absolutely love it because they're like, I hear this guy with all this experience, he's struggling and he's showing me ways to, uh, to, to uh, you know, conquer over these, these shortfalls and errors that he's making. And this is really cool. And so there's a certain approachability with that. And there's a, there's a, a friendship that can occur in a small environment. And I only take 12 people. My courses are always limited to 12. So I get to know everybody really well and we spend most of our time doing the work. It's not about talking about it. You know, you go to a dental conference today and you're gonna see highly Photoshopped, beautiful, European style, gorgeous, dentistry. And I got to tell you, that's not the real world. That that probably took that clinician three days to prep that tooth and make that final restoration with the laboratory technician standing by him the entire time. And to present that as though this is what's achievable, I think it's inspiring. But at the same time, it's, it's sort of doing a disservice to us because it makes us feel like, gee, I'm not that good. And so what I try to do is tell everybody, hey, look, you, you probably can't be that good in a real world situation, but let's strive for that. And let me show you the ways that we can get a little closer to that in a real world way, you know, in our private practices. Uh, it doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to involve uh, these unreachable levels of ceramic, uh, you know, mastery. We could do this in our own practices if we understand the techniques. So uh, that's our approach. And I, I do uh, courses for general dentists that have many years of experience. Uh, they love getting new techniques. For example, we do posterior cer uh, ceramics courses where maybe a dentist is a little bit uh, unsure about a certain uh, immediate dent and sealing or uh, how to handle covering a cusp just exactly the right way. So they'll come to the course and they'll be sitting next to a student that's just graduated six months before. And the two of them are learning simultaneously new techniques and there's this, hey, we're all in this together type of a feeling. And the, like I said, the first thing I do is I'll prep a tooth and I'll make a mistake. And everyone goes, ah, cool. Mistakes can be made. How does he overcome the mistake? Yeah. Oh, I get it. And so this, this, this process is really, really fun. It's hard to do that in a dental school environment. It's really hard to do that in a CE course for that matter as well. 
most CE courses, and you know, I'm th speaking of the ones that I've taught all over the place, uh, typically try to fill the classroom with a lot of people. And so you'll get 25, 35 people in a hands-on course, and the instructor doesn't get to know anybody's name. They don't really get to push people. Uh, they don't have the opportunity to take for to, you know, make videos live or photographs and show the work that's being done by the participants. And uh, they have to. It's a different model. So uh, that's that's been my approach. So I think that my niche is is definitely uh, one that has not been filled previously. Uh, it's gaining a lot of traction. I'm absolutely shocked at the growth of my YouTube videos. I cannot believe it that in just six months, I went from zero subscribers to over 7,000. Uh, and it doesn't seem to be letting up. I'm picking up about 50 subs every day. Um, I have about 50 videos that I already have in the queue that I'm going to be putting out. I'm digging this. This is super fun. Uh, the comments I get are awesome. And, uh, and when I'm wrong and I get a comment that someone has a different opinion, I'm always happy to entertain it and, and say, hey, that's a really good piece of information. And it's, I'll include that in a future video. And I think that that's how we all learn. So uh, that's the inspiration, Howard. I wanted to take the, the skills that I had learned from my mentors, the methodologies in teaching that I had learned from uh, my, my dental educator mentors at UCLA, and my, uh, my passion, my passion for continuous hard work and improvement uh, has, uh, those three things have really um, formed my motivation to start my own center for teaching. And your courses are at um, San Dimas, California, you say 15 miles west of Ontario International Airport. Is that Toronto, Ontario, Canada? <laughs> oh, uh, San Dimas is famous for two things: Bill and Ted's, uh, <laughs> Bill and Ted's Adventure, and the water slide. It was the first big water slide in the United States. So, and it's a sleepy little town of about thirty-five thousand. It hasn't grown or shrunk in the last thirty years, and it's a very nice non-LA type environment. And uh, we have uh, uh, a great center there with. Uh, very large hands-on stations and uh, my wife makes lunch for everybody uh, we get to know everybody quite well we go out to lunch together when she's not cooking and uh, it's uh, it's worked out really well for us now is the ontario international airport is that the one that's also called john wayne no that's in that's in orange county so ontario international airport is about 40 miles Mm, yeah, maybe about 35, 40 miles east of downtown LA. And it's an airport where you, you, you land and you can walk to your car and there's no traffic. And so you want to okay. get dropped off at that airport, there's no traffic. It's the only problem with Ontario International Airport is we don't have flights from every city yet. So it's, uh, uh, you know, it, sometimes what? you get to the airport. So another thing I wanted to ask you, and by, by the way, this is not a commercial. I asked you to come on the show. You didn't ask me. I'm a big fan of your YouTube channel, and I, I, I hope you post a lot of these YouTube videos in a thread because you said you got 7,000. I think you can pick up several thousand more uh, by um, this podcast and posting these on um, some of these on Dental Town. But or is there any order? I'm, I'm looking at your 2019 courses. Uh, March 1, posterior ceramics. April, anterior ceramic veneers. April, uh, cast gold restorations, and then you have anterior composites, you have diagnostic diamonds, posterior composites, implant restorative, posterior ceramics, anterior ceramics, anterior composites, diagnostic diamond. Is there any order, like, do you, do you recommend they have to take the diagnostic diamond before nope. they start drilling, filling, and Not filling? Not at all. Well, well that, I, I want to I go through these courses and just to tell me some, so you're saying there's no order you have to take them in? It's nice to take the diagnostic diamond first, but it's not absolutely necessary. Okay, well, let's talk about some of these words. Posterior ceramics. Um, does that, um, ceram whenever you say ceramics, that's an indirect. Are you a big fan of CAD CAM, uh, oral scanning? Uh, talk about posterior ceramics. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a fan of all of it. Uh, I scan. Uh, I, I've been scanning. Uh, since the early, early days, I've been a, uh, trained in CIRIC uh, 26 or 27 years ago and have gone through all the evolutions. I was the one that brought the CAD CAM technology to UCLA in the restorative department. 
uh, years ago. From and, France? Uh, pardon me? From France? No. <laughs> no. Uh, I, oh, I, I brought I brought the the Serona Ceric technology to UCLA as a teaching and clinical um, treatment option uh, years ago. So we basically went from impressions with traditional materials to scanning as an option. The students do both. Uh, I personally am going to be teaching the course with scanning as an option to conventional impressions. So both can be done. I think that you need to know how to do both. And the, the key is that the tissue management for scanning and the tissue management for taking a conventional impression are exactly the same. And that is the hardest part about impressions. So whether you scan it and you get this incredibly accurate scan that you work from, or whether you take a conventional impression, you need to manage the tissues properly. And that's a big part of what we talk about. We, we talk about uh, indications for onlays and partial coverage ceramic materials. When can you do something less than a full crown? When is it okay to keep things super gingival? Uh, what about bonding? Do we have to bond every crown we do or can we use conventional cements on some and bond others? And what are the indications for those? How do we polish these materials? How do you polish zirconia? I mean, this, this hard, hard product. How do you polish that compared to Emacs? Uh, how do you deal with feldspathic materials? And uh, so there's a lot of confusion. There are a lot of materials. There's a lot of things evolving. A lot. It's a it, it's significantly, uh, you know, evolving science. So we stay on top of it. Um, I'm constantly going to conferences. I'm educating myself, bringing new new information to our courses. But the course is is pretty robust because it's. Uh, many, many hours of hands-on training uh, where they actually get to prepare the teeth and fabricate restorations out of ceramic and cement them. Uh, so they get to go to go through the entire process. And if you are somebody that's never done an indirect posterior ceramic restoration and you read an article or watch a YouTube video, you're not going to have the confidence or the abilities to really do that predictably in your practice. You've got to be taken to the next level. You need a mentor. You need to be able to prove that you can do it. You need to sit down and go through the steps and not just listen to somebody talk about it and try it on a patient. I think it needs to be uh, taught at a higher level. And that's, that's where our courses are coming from. I start the day with a very short lecture, probably 45 minutes to an hour. That's it. And then we get right into the hands-on. And then we stop people at times and we bring up little five-minute lectures or little demos or such, such and such. And uh, this is how the, the, the courses uh, generally go. They're not filled with six hours of lecture and a two-hour time slot to throw in a little, a little practice on, a, on an extracted tooth. I think that that's uh, typically what most hands-on courses do in the CE community. And I think that that's uh, much less effective than, than what we're doing. So, um, and by the way, uh, when you get your FAGD, it's 500 hours of continued education, five right. years, all day exam. But when you get your mastership in the HD, it's another 600 hours, but 400 hours of those have to be hands-on. You got and it. And you could get a lot of hands-on hours going through these courses. I'm, I'm going to go back to, um, yep. this is dentistry uncensored. I don't want to talk about anything everyone agrees on. It's really <laughs> stressful when these kids have four or $500,000 of student loans, and then they're looking at a $145,000 uh, CAD cam. And um, is, do you, but is that, they're already half a million dollars in debt. Would you say just go for it and spend another 145, which is another year of dental school? No, or, no, I wouldn't. I don't think that's this. a, I don't think that's a smart move at all. I think that the, that if you're going to, First of all, you have to understand when you have a CAD CAM and a chair side milling machine, you are the laboratory. And if you really want to be the laboratory and if that is your passion, then fine, go for it and uh, get yourself in more debt. And it's going to take you a long, long time to see the return on that investment. My recommendation is this. Go into the digital world a little bit more carefully. Go into the digital world slowly. You can purchase scanners with open platforms that can be purchased for a fraction of the cost of the milling machines. And then you can start scanning and outsourcing those to laboratories who will then take the STL files and fabricate the restorations and see how that goes first. Uh, and if that is something that you're just loving, but you want to be able to provide the patients with a faster turnaround time, 
okay, buy the milling machine. But once you've bought that milling machine, you have just committed yourself to a big, expensive piece of equipment that is going to break down. It is going to have uh, the need to replace the the milling ends, the tips. It's going to it's it's they're fussy. I've got four milling machines, and I know how these work, and they are a pain in the butt. So yeah. I, I I'm going to say that in and I, and at UCLA we had uh, many more than that, and we were constantly having to up upkeep these things and to the point where we almost needed a full-time person just to keep the machines running so new doctors i know it looks really appealing to get into the cad cam world i know it looks really great to get a cbct in your office i know that sounds like what you've got to do but i would recommend against it i think that you can outsource your uh cone beam uh, radiographs, you can uh, save a lot of money and don't buy a milling machine. I'm sorry, uh, Serona, but I just don't think it's the right move for a new practitioner. Yeah, word <laughs> word to your mother. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah. Uh, oh, the same question, 3M. I've, I've been using Empergum, which originally was SP out of Germany, then 3M bought it. But right. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I could do an Empergum impression for 17 bucks, and 3M wants to sell me a $17,000 TrueDef scanner where just the just the uh, software support is $200 a month. Right. I mean, so $200 a month, if you're averaging a $17 impression, uh, 200 divided by 17, heck, that's another 12 impressions. So my question to you is, how do I justify going from a $17 Impergum impression to a $17,000 TrueDef scanner? And and when you said scanning, you recommended open platforms, but that might have whooshed over someone's head and you didn't give a name brand. So um, so there's there. what I like to do is throw like five questions at you, hoping that maybe one of them is good enough for you to bite on <laughs> and answer. But Well, I think that uh, I like the Trio scanner. I think it's an amazing a piece of equipment. Um, we get scans at my laboratory from different scanning platforms and um, we're able to uh, mill with uh, whatever we get. It's not a problem, uh, but design and mill. But I, I, I said, if, if you absolutely believe that you must get into this, this impression capturing technology, great, let's start slow. But I completely agree with you, right? You know, for a guy that has four milling machines, and I mill every material that dentistry makes from titanium, gold, chromium, cobalt, and all the ceramic materials, from a guy that is a 27 year user of CIRIC technology, how do I perform dentistry in my practice? Impressions, conventional impressions. Why do I do it that way? Because I, it's predictable. I don't have an extra piece of equipment sitting in the operatory. It's very, very uh, simple for me to do, and I believe that it's uh, quite cost-effective. Uh, and I'm not doing it this way because I'm an old-school guy. I'm doing it this way because I'm a new-school guy. I actually believe that I am able to capture consistently better impressions when I'm using polyvinyl materials or ether materials than I can when I'm scanning. Because there's that <clears throat> the dimension this sort of fourth dimension of impression taking is that's not talked about is that you've got an open sulcus and now you've got to grab the scanner and you've got to scan that sulcus. And until they develop a, a scanner that can scan through soft tissue and blood, man, you are in a hurry. And now you've got the patient holding their mouth open and rather than inserting a material into the sulcus with pressure and a volumetric change occurring in that sulcus with the matray being inserted, now you're in this passive mode. So now you can't do anything with the tissue anymore. The tissue has to be completely retracted. And now you've got to scan that area with usually a quite large scanning wand. Uh, you know, even the small ones are large compared to the simple procedure of injecting around a tooth with uh, impression material. So I think that, you know, you, you, you find yourself in that situation with crown and bridge and inlays and onlays and things like that. Where I do think scanning has a great place is for the clear aligner technology. And, you know, whenever we're doing any, any uh, non-braces versions, these clear aligners, uh, Invisalign, things like that, I think that scanning has a, a tremendous uh, benefit for the practice if that's the direction you want to go. And 
if they wanted to go to clear aligners uh, scanning because they're doing clear aligners, um, Align Technology owns Invisalign and Itero. Is that yep. where you would go? Would, yep, would you do? It is. It is it where is. you go. It's it's where I would go, and it's also where I'd buy stock too. Because if you've looked at yeah. <laughs> Align Technologies, has just been an incredibly successful company, and I think that that is, I you know, go with the winners. Yes, and also um, you've lectured around the world, and I was blown away at how little girls talked about Invisalign in Cambodia, Malaysia, <laughs> South Africa. Wow. I mean, I mean, women. And men want to be more beautiful, and and I, I and when I read, when I read the fact that only five percent of Americans have had orthodontics, man, that's a lot of upside to that market. You got right, absolutely upside, upside, upside. Okay, um, I and uh, I wanted to also, so you would go uh, that way. Um, I want I want to I want to talk about a couple more of your courses because I um, I've heard nothing on Dental Town everybody rants and raves about you um, I want to go I'm going to switch over to again to uh, um, Diagnostic Diamond because mm. what I see I mean who cares if you did the perfect molar root canal but they didn't need a root canal and they had a exactly. sinus infection <laughs> or you you did the most ultimate retreat root canal but you didn't understand that the tooth was fractured i mean i mean i would rather my doctor or especially a surgeon get an a on the diagnosis and a c on the treatment than an a on the treatment and the wrong diagnosis um talk about diagnostic diamond because i think i yep. mean that's why you're a doctor and right. you gotta you right. gotta get the diagnosis right you're right. And, you know, and, and, and it's said that there are many different treatment options, but there's only one correct diagnosis. Nice. And one of the things that I, I do in the diagnostic diamond is I take people through a four part uh, approach to looking at every case. We look at the we look at the gums, we look at the teeth, we look at the occlusion, and then we also look at the aesthetics. And these four areas make four corners of a diamond, so like a baseball diamond. And uh, that's been my, my approach. Uh, John Coyce, uh, Frank Spear, uh, two of my amazing mentors uh, whom I have learned so much from, use a very similar approach. So I think that... Uh, so what would, be home, what would be home plate, first base, second base, and third for this analogy? Yeah, home, home base would be perio. And then your first base would be uh, your structure, your biomechanics. That's all, all things about teeth. Uh, second base is, is going to be uh, the uh, function. And then third base would be the aesthetics. And, you know, we, we have to start when we, when we hit the ball, we got to start on perio. And then we can work our way around the bases to aesthetics. And unfortunately, what happens in diagnosis is people are, are, kind of thinking about maybe that perio is absolutely the most important thing to to treat first and uh, yet they don't understand how aesthetic aesthetics is what needs to be actually planned first so it's a kind of an interesting reverse process every case should be planned based on the aesthetics but implemented based on the perio and starting with the eradication of periodontal disease or the control of that, and then moving into structure, understanding function, and then finally being able to deliver the aesthetics with all of those previous bases having been, been covered. So uh, what we teach in the course is to, to look at the patient as a person in their smile position and make some determinations about what is okay and what needs to be changed with their smile. From there, you can then go into function, what needs to be changed functionally to make this work, and then what needs to be changed structurally, and then what needs to be changed periodontally. But in terms of the implementation of, in, the implementation of that particular plan, we start with the perio. Now, I'd like to uh, kind of give you a different analogy. Let's imagine that you are going to build your dream house. You found a piece of property that is exactly what you want. And so you're just, you're standing out in front of the property and you're envisioning what? When you're looking at this piece of property, 
Well, you're looking at the house. You're looking at the final house sitting on that piece of property. You know exactly where the front door is going to be, where the garage is going to be, where the master bedroom is going to be. You imagine that first. Do you look at that piece of property and imagine the plumbing? Do you look at that property and imagine the framing and the, the hinges and the working parts of the house? Of course not. So when we look at a patient, let's look at them as the finished house. But then let's go back and engineer how do we achieve that? Well, we've got to start with the perio. We've got to understand the teeth. We've got to understand what restorative procedures are, are best for this patient. And then how to make it work. Who cares if you have a house, but the, the garage door doesn't open and gets stuck every time you push open? Who cares if the windows don't? if the windows don't slide open and closed or the light switches don't work, that's all function. So function is incredibly important. And then uh, finally, the aesthetics can be predictable if all of those things are done just right. So uh, the diagnostic diamond is a, it's a philosophical approach, but it's also a practical approach where we can achieve a diagnosis for every aspect around the basis of, of that baseball diamond. And we know what treatment options are going to be possible to achieve the solution to that diagnostic, diagnostic issue. And uh, what we teach in this course, course is it blows people's mind. In, in three days, their, their head is spinning because they have, they have found out things that they believed in that were completely wrong. They have learned more about occlusion in three days uh, than they've usually learned in the entire time they were in dental school. Uh, and we bring in so many incredible concepts and in such a simple way to understand them that you can implement in your practice right away that this diagnostic diamond course is, is a real important one. Um, I would love it if everyone took that course first, but uh, sometimes people have to ease into ease into these courses and decide, well, let me try them out and let's see how this composite course is first. And if I like him, maybe I'll come back. And, you know, that's the way it works. And I'm okay with that because I know that once they come, we've got them because we, we, we're the real deal. And we show people how to turn this new knowledge into better results right away. I still have questions for you and I've gone over the hour. Can I keep you a little bit for overtime? Sure. Um, I want to ask you, um, you look at the nine specialties in dentistry, and mm -hmm. there's hardly any debate debates among, uh, like like pediatric dentists, they only debate really about silver diamine fluoride. The endodontist, you go to dinner with eight endodontists, they don't really argue about anything. But why is, <laughs> why is occlusion so controversial? Why are there so many camps? And, and I want you, I want to hold your feet to the fire because they ask specific questions. Well, should I go learn pinky? occlusion or neuromuscular i mean there's lvi there's yep. neuromuscular some people say to learn occlusion you got to have fifteen thousand dollars of uh of equipment and and t scans and and they 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 just want to know where do they go first they know they want to learn more about occlusion but they feel like it's almost like you saying to me you want to learn about religion i say we well, got to pick a religion first are you going to be a hindu a buddhist a catholic <laughs> so so um, why is it, do you agree that it's confusing? I do, I do. And, and there are at least six different philosophies of occlusion. And wow. they, they, at least six. And uh, I have learned from many of those, the masters of those six, and have taken courses in uh, many different philosophies. But it wasn't until I uh, started getting mentored by John Coyce in uh, Seattle and Frank Spear, who's now in Scottsdale, uh, many, many years ago, that they were able to look past all of the, the fervor that may exist in any one of these religious beliefs <laughs> of the, about occlusion uh, and, and, and get to the practical aspect of things. And uh, that really uh, worked for me, and I was able to see how well it worked in my practice, too. And so uh, I, I think that, you know, we need to be open-minded about change. We need to be open-minded about changing our philosophies. You know, how do you change somebody's philosophy about occlusion that's written three textbooks on the subject and has their entire institute based on one philosophy? If that person is being exposed to a new philosophy that makes sense, they're going to reject it because it undermines everything they've built in the last 30 or 40 years. So I wanted to find 
uh, mentors that were willing to say what I knew in the past is wrong and this is the direction we're headed. And that's what I've subscribed to. And so what I teach in my centers is a uh, an approach that actually works with works well within any of these other philosophies because it really at the at the foundation is the patient's got to be comfortable chewing. You know, when's the last time you went to a dentist and you sat in the chair and they said Hey, Howard, how's your chewing going? Zero. Are dentists asking patients, how well do you chew? It's not happening. And that's function. That's really what it's all about. So I, I think that the, uh, the approach we take is based on the philosophies, these amazing philosophies, these incredible science has been done, all of these different uh, positions about occlusion. But... Uh, perhaps in a way, made it more clear. Not simple, but clear and reproducible in your private practice. And that's, I think, what, what really stuck with me. It wasn't so much a philosophy as it was a practical approach, which worked time and time again. So you got to go to his, his YouTube channel. I mean, it's, um, it's youtube.com forward slash Stevenson Dental Solutions. You also have... Um, um, you, so you have your lecture class in um, LA or near LA, yeah, right. and uh, but you also have online continuing education. Talk about your online courses. Uh, we have several. Uh, the the online courses are uh, basically you watch a video and uh, we send you a quiz. You answer the quiz and you grab a CE unit. And uh, the um, we were really fortunate to get ADA SERP approval last year. Uh, that's a very difficult process. That also uh, is um, transferable to PACE for anyone in the uh, Academy of General Dentistry going for mastership or fellowship. Um, and uh, that's just how it works. And we plan on, on releasing many, many, many more uh, of these uh, online versions. It's simply watch a video watch a lecture, and uh, then answer a little quiz, and you're good to go. You know, uh, again, I know you don't need any marketing or advertising, but if I was you from a business point of view, I would put one of those courses on Dental Town. We have online C courses, and then it would it would mass market your name and brand and online C courses. Um, Howard Goldstein, HOGO at dentaltown.com h-o-g-o -O for howard goldstein hogo at dentaltown.com but you've already got the courses i'd put one of them on dentaltown and then say if you want to watch the other gazillion but i see <laughs> what are you, but i see what are your courses Good. that almost makes me want to cry you have a rpd design right yeah <laughs> and yes. and so the i don't know if anybody if people know this but a lot of labs they don't want to cast the partial framework so right so you think you're using your lab in iowa but they're mailing it down to Nogales, Arizona, and then they exactly. drive them across the street into Mexico. And right. I drive down there, and I see this lab, this lab down there. I love the lab. They get over 1,000 impressions a day, and 90% of all the impression, it's just the impression, and it says lower partial. And I'm like, dude, you're a doctor? And you just said an impression and said lower partial. First of all, what do you think of the, and that's real. I've seen this with my own eyes. I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. It's a three hour, and I love going yeah. down to New Mexico. Um, what would you say to the doctors who take an impression and just put lower partial and send it to the lab? I'm like, come on, guys. <laughs> Please. Uh, you're not doing the patient any favor there. I mean, you learned how to do partial dentures in dental school by the, by your prosthodontist, and maybe you thought that they were making it more complicated than it needed to be, but I, there is no easy way to make a partial denture proper. You've got to design it. You have to have a cast. You have to survey it, and that's what we teach in this uh, design course. And and uh, it, it it it's very sad to learn that that's that that happens. And you're right. I mean, I think it probably happens more than ninety percent of the time that uh, just lower impressions are taken and they're sent off, uh, uh, make lower partial. Um, we've got to do better. We've got to do better as a profession. We, we're, we're smarter than that. We're capable and we have the skills. Let's not let the quest for the easy buck in practice um, be more important than what we know is right. Let's always remember that. We have taken an oath to do our patients 
the best service we possibly can. And um, I, you know, I, I don't think anybody in the right mind would argue with what I just said. Uh, it is the approach that any one of us would want to have our doctors take when they were taking care of us. Well said. And I just one final question. The one 4,000 pound elephant in the room that no one talks about. Um, four and a half percent of Americans will in, will finish their life out in a nursing home. Um, um, it's it's a little it's just a tad under five percent. And geriatric dentistry doesn't get any headlines, but they're telling us that in the nursing home, they're getting one root surface cavity per month. And I see dentists getting these patients in. It's a big, expensive pain to go pick up a lady. A lot of times they got dementia, Alzheimer's. They take him to the dental office and he'll put in 12 class five composites. Hmm. And, and do you think when you have Alzheimer's, dementia, arthritis, can't brush, can't floss, do you think a composite was the best restoration for a root surface I, cavity? No, sir, I do not. And we would not do that. Uh, I don't think I've ever treated a, a patient with those similar uh, similar uh, conditions in that way. Uh, I would place an amalgam. If I could get some isolation, I might place a glass ion or restoration, but I would never place a composite there. I think that's a uh, but then, science, but then, science has but, shown us otherwise. But what percent of the dentists will say, well, I don't even have amalgam in my office. And I'm like, how do you have 2,000 patients be a doctor of dental surgery mm. and you don't even have an amalgam tool in your toolbox? I mean, is that is that a well-rounded doctor? Uh, I don't think it is. I don't think it is. I think and, we and, need to... You know, Howard, I think they need to know how to do amalgams, composites, glass ionomers, gold work. We need to know how to do it all. And we were taught all of this. And if we weren't taught, learn. And uh, then you can offer your patients more options, more appropriate options. And and the and the, the one that gets me the most that I, I don't know whether to laugh or cry is to say, well, my entire office is metal free. I'm like, what are, you, what are you flying, a plastic airplane on Southwest? So, I mean, what is metal? How, how is metal the new bad guy? Really? I, I, I mean, isn't that when we went from Stonehenge to advancing well, our civilization when we learned to work with metals? Apparently that person doesn't do implants. Yeah. So. Well, well, they're going to zirconium. Yeah, zirconia is a, is a, is a new the new uh, ceramic. But if you don't look, if you look at zirconia. Zirconium, the element on the periodic table, it looks like aluminum. It is metal. This is a metal oxide. So metal oxides are part of all of our ceramics. So it's interesting that people say they're metal free. Uh, they, I don't know how they can avoid uh, the <laughs> the elements on the periodic table that are in every compo every single one of our ceramic systems that we use. So go to Stephen Sun S O N uh, DentalSolutions.com. Um, again, I was so excited when you agreed to come on the show. Sure. Uh, I'm a big fan of yours and, uh, my gosh, uh, my homies enjoyed this so much. Thank you so much for coming Thanks, on Howard. the show today. It's been a pleasure. All right. All Happy best. New Year's, buddy. And by the Happy way, if you, if you want, ever want to write an article on anything we talked about for Dental Town Magazine, please send it in because, uh, I, I like, I like these kids to listen to the old guys. I, I am so old. Do you realize when I got out of dental school, the, the Dead Sea was only sick? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Have a great day. Take care, Hal.